so this is Rita. Rita and I were both hired last semester to teach career exploration and career strategy. And she and I have been collaborating on building these courses. And we wanted to talk to you about imposter syndrome and finding the confidence in your career as you continue to, or rather for my 1890 classes specifically, we are now moving into career execution. It's the final phase of this class where we're going to start looking at what positions we're going to apply for, what majors we're going to commit to. And sometimes we can feel this sense of, well, I'm not qualified for that, or I don't have the skills necessary for that internship, or maybe I'm not ready to commit because I don't think I'm capable. Our self-efficacy or how we view our capabilities might be a little bit lower than what we actually are capable of. And so we want to talk about that today as we move into this transitory state of, yeah, okay, you know what? I'm going to be a marketer, or I'm going to be in finance, or I'm going to be in accounting, whatever it might be. You're going to likely run into this phenomenon. So we have three guest speakers here that are going to all share their experience, talk about how to overcome it, and how to prepare for that future opportunity. So I'm going to pass the time over to Rita, who will introduce our guest speakers. Please pay close attention and we will give them a big round of applause. Okay, so I'm excited to be here. Um, let's talk a little bit about this. So, oh, so I am here today to tell you to apply for that job. Okay, so we've all seen those uh, job postings come up. We've seen where we may only qualify for 50 to maybe 75%. I want you to apply for that job, okay? So by the time we're done here today, that's what I'm hoping you're gonna do. So do we all know who these people are? Or am I just dating myself with some of these people? <laughs> so Tom Hanks, Emma Watson, Sheryl Sandberg, David Bowie, um, Howard Schultz, and Maya Angelou. What is something that they all share? What's some common thing that they all share? They're successful. They're successful. Okay, what else? What else do they share? They're all in the public eye. All in the public eye. I like that one. Anything else you think they share? Okay, they share something that I've had and that I've experienced. They all share a lack of confidence in themselves and imposter syndrome. So I've got a few things, I've got a few things for you. So no matter what we've done, there comes a point when you think, how did I get here? When are they going to discover that I am in fact a fraud and take everything away from me? Tom Hanks. This is uh, a Tom Hanks quote from in the last couple of years, not when he started. This is in the last couple of years. Tom Hanks, how successful is he? Extremely successful, okay? How about Maya Angelou? I've written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're gonna find out now. I've run a game on everybody and they're, gonna find, and they're gonna, going to find me. Yeah, anybody felt that way? Okay, uh, very few people, whether you've been in that job before or not, get into that seat, believe today that they are qualified to be CEO. They're not gonna tell you that, but it's true. Howard Schultz, okay? Uh, when I receive recognition for my acting, I feel incredibly uncomfortable. I tend to turn on myself and I feel like an imposter. Emma Watson. She's a great actress, is she not? Um, every time I took a test, I was sure it had gone badly. And every time I didn't embarrass myself or even um, excelled, I believed I had fooled everyone yet again. One day soon, the jig would be up. There are still days when I wake up feeling like a fraud, not sure I should be where I am. Sheryl Sandberg. And the reason that I end with the, the quote by Sheryl Sandberg is um, I'm going to tell you something. So I have an executive MBA uh, from the University of Utah. If you would have seen me after Bob's class, because uh, you take him on day one, Dr. Or Dr. Allen's class, uh, you would have found me in the bathroom crying with three other girls, okay? And I'm not kidding you. We sat in the bathroom and we cried because we felt like we didn't belong and that somebody was going to figure out that we didn't belong there, okay? There were some uh, women from the class in front of us who came into the bathroom and said, hey, don't talk to yourself that way. You belong here, you belong just like everyone else. Um, and, uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit after um, Dr. Allen speaks to us about what that's like, okay? Because you're going to apply for jobs. By the time we leave here today, I want you to apply for that job that you meet 50 to 75%, even if you're feeling this way. So, uh, 
I asked Dr. Allen, I sent him a simple email real quick. I sent him an email and I said, hey, I'm noticing some things in my students that I've also noticed in myself. I'm wondering if you have felt this way when you applied for this role as a dean. Because correct me if I'm wrong, you haven't been dean before. No. So he didn't say, and I said, if you would have felt this way, would you come talk to my class? He had a one sentence reply to me that was, when do you want me to come talk? Okay. So I want you to know that everybody feels this way. Okay. Or most of us feel this way. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Allen. All right. So I'm going to start not so much talking about this job. I'm going to start with an experience that happened when I first arrived at university. Okay. So in high school, I was a decent student. I would say I wasn't a great student, but I was probably, you know, the top 25% of my class, but I definitely wasn't in the top 10% of my class. Or, and and I, I took some classes that I, I was in classes with some of those college prep kind of classes with some really smart kids. And I always felt like they were smarter than I was. And, and so when I got to university, suddenly I was terrified. Um, I, I, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. And so I packed up and I moved and I, my, I went to BYU. And so I'm away from home for the first time. And I was thinking, man, if I flunked out, uh, there's a lot of smart kids at BYU. And if I flunked out of BYU, that would be so embarrassing to have to go home and, you know, well, I thought you were going to school. What are you doing back home? You know, that I'd have to answer this question. I mean, I was, I was, that thought ran through my mind repeatedly. And I remember I walked into a very large, one of my first classes that semester was an econ class. It had like 300 people and it was in a big auditorium. And I was so intimidated because at that time I sort of equated intelligence and um, whether you were smart or not with your age, right? Because what did I know? I knew that fifth graders were smarter than first graders. I knew that juniors were smarter than freshmen. And what am I here in this 300 class? I'm the dumbest guy in this class because I'm the least experienced. At that time, you know, the way birthdays and whatever worked in Arizona, and when you start school, I was younger. I had my birthday. I was a 17-year-old freshman, right? And so here I am in class. And there were guys in this class that, like, they had beards. Well, they didn't. They could grow a beard, I should say. Not they didn't have beards there. But they, they need. I had a razor, but I didn't really need it. And so the teacher on the first day of class says, you need to work hard in this class because experience suggests that 10% of you or about 30 of you are not going to succeed in passing this class. You know, that scared me. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm the dumbest guy in the class and he's telling me that 10% of the people are gonna flunk and that must, I must be among that group. So what did I do? I was, he scared me into studying really hard and I did. I studied really hard and, um, but even though I worked really hard when it came time to take the first exam, I was really scared and I had my choice to take the exam over two days. And so I kind of planned, well, I'll take it on the first day cause I got other stuff and other classes. So I remember walk, starting to walk over to the testing center where you'd take an exam like this. And I got so scared on my way to take the exam that I turned around and I went back to my room and started to study again. And I made a deal with myself. I'm gonna study for one hour. And if I can find something that I don't already know while I'm studying, then I'll keep studying. But if I can't find anything as I study that I don't already know, then I'll go take the test and I'll still probably flunk it, but I'll at least know that I've done the best I can do. That was my mindset. So I went home and I went back to my room and I studied for an hour and I found nothing that I didn't already know. As I read the book, as I read my notes, 
even as I read like the, the descriptions under pictures and the footnotes at the bottom of the page, I couldn't find anything that I didn't already know. No, I know that. Yeah, I know that. So I went and took this test and it was 25 multiple choice questions. And as I worked through the exam, I was like, man, this thing is really easy. I'm shocked at how easy it is because he, he said 10% of the people are gonna flunk this exam. How could anybody flunk? This is, he was pulling our leg. And you know, the hard test is coming later or something. So I got to the, you know, I went through the whole test and there were, I was positive that I was getting, that there were 23 questions I had right. And there were two where I had it narrowed down to two answers and I was pretty sure that I got, that I picked the right one of the two, but I wasn't positive. And I turned in the exam and it graded and um, turned out I got 100% on the exam. But I thought, man, everybody's gonna get in the 90s on this thing, it's just, it was too easy. So I go back to class, 300 people, and, and just as they, a couple classes later, they shared the distribution of how people did on this test. And, you know, these, these older looking people that were sitting around me when the distribution got put up on the board were just, there was just stunning them, but there's, you know, like below 50, so many people. And, you know, between 50 and 60, there was this many. And so, and they got up and then, you know, 90 to 99, he put, you know, it was just a handful of people. And then it said 100%, one person. And that moment changed my life. It changed my life because it gave me confidence that I did not have. And I knew that if I worked hard, I could do things. I could do well in school if I worked hard. And so I would encourage you to reflect on the moments in your life. Maybe that, that was a pretty big one for me. And maybe, maybe yours, your moments are different and distinct and, and smaller and you didn't, but, or not smaller, but just different. And, and so, but, but I, what, what I would encourage you to do, invite you to do is think about the good things that you've done in your life, the successes that you've had in your life and remember those experiences and so often the dialogue that goes on in our head is negative. I think that's just human nature. And, and I think we have to work at it to tell ourselves a positive narrative. This narrative that, you know, Tom Hanks isn't a, you know, that he worries that he's, I mean, he's one of the best actors on the planet and has had an amazingly successful, and all those people amazingly successful and, I think it's, it must be a common thing for, for at least many of us to have this kind of negative narrative emerge in our heads. And I, one of the things that's been helpful to me when I feel that negative narrative is like, okay, when I've had problems or concerns or lack of confidence before, when I work through it and I do my best, like I did when I studied for that econ test, a lot of times there's been a positive outcome. And so, I can work through whatever is facing me now, I can work through that and I can figure that out. Remembering the positive narrative. So again, I, I look at this now, you know, I'm a dean uh, in uh, the business school. There are seven deans on campus. I'm the newest one. I'm the least experienced one. Um, and I'm, I'm learning. It's on the job learning and there's so much to learn and I feel like um, it's a challenge to come up to speed and to figure things out. And I'm working with people that I've never worked with before. You know, one of my responsibilities is for fundraising and I'm working with people who make a lot more money than I've made in my life. And, you know, there's, there's a name on the building here, the, the Keller building, you know, you, to, getting your name on a building, that's someone who's been really successful and then after their success that has been really generous with their resources. And I'm working with people like that to all of a sudden, you know, I used to be a professor that worked with students like Rita was when she was in the executive MBA program. And, 
And I, I was, I'm comfortable there. I did that for 30 years. I learned to be comfortable doing that. Um, but here in a new role, I have things to learn. And I guess the thing that I would, would invite us to think about is build on your successes, believe that you can do it, and there's no substitute for hard work, um, but believe in yourselves. Um, it's, it's really important that you learn that skill, believe in yourself, because um, it doesn't go well when we don't. <laughs> um, believe in yourselves. You can accomplish amazing things. Your human potential is amazing. You can do, you can cure cancer. You can, when you put your mind to it, you can figure it out. Um, and so that would be my message to you is to learn how to do that. Learn how to believe in yourself and focus on the successes that you've had, build on them, work hard, and great things are bound to happen in your lives. Uh, when they first brought it to my attention, I was like, oh man, I'm too busy. Uh, I don't want to, I, in fact, there were two Dean searches, right? So the first Dean search I didn't participate in, I was invited to by some friends here in the school said, Hey, we think you ought to apply for this. And I didn't, I was, cause I felt like I was too busy. I had some volunteer responsibilities that were taking a lot of my time. And so I didn't. And, and I really didn't have time to do a good job of doing the search. And then um, that first search failed and it was eight months later and the volunteer responsibilities that I had were coming to an end. And, and so my friends reached out again and said, hey, we think you ought to apply. And I thought, wow. I, but again, I came down here, I saw this saw the building and I, I realized that UVU was way ahead of where it was in my mind, right? I, when I joined University of Utah 30 plus years ago, I think it had just gotten switched from being a community college and it was a brand new state college and, um, you know, much smaller and anyhow, the, the, the maturity and the growth that's happened here is really phenomenal. And then the more I began to study and learn about where UV, what UVU is doing, I realized that, oh my goodness, these are my people. This, the, the faculty that work here are focused primarily on students and that's their primary objective. And I didn't feel like it was that way where I came from. And, and I, I wished there, I, that I could work with more people. There are some people there that are great that do that, but there are others that are really more focused on other activities. And, you know, it's a research one institution and that's, that's a primary focus there. And sometimes mm -hmm. in some of the, with some of those researchers, the, you know, that's the primary focus and teaching and is kind of a secondary focus. And, and so this, this just started to feel like a really good fit. So I guess my, my thought process started with, gosh, do I really want to do that? And why would I want to be a dean? And, and then as I, as I learned more about the mission of this institution, I started to get really excited about the possibility of working with people who really are focused on creating great opportunities for students. And that was what attracted me to want to come. But again, still you, you wonder, gee, I, I've never been a dean. I'd been a department chair, never really been in this. Usually the path to dean is like, you'd be a department chair and then you'd be an associate dean and then you'd be a dean. And I'd never really worked in a dean's office. And so that worried me. But then I, I was like, well, I did have some other leadership opportunities, that volunteer responsibility that I talked about. I was president of the American Accounting Association. And I thought, oh yeah, that's kind of, that's a good thing. And I'd been on a board of a bank for 15 years. And um, 
you know, had had experiences where I had, you know, hired and fired CEOs and CFOs in that role and thought, well, yeah, there were some leadership experiences there. And then I, I, in some volunteer responsibilities, I worked at, served on the board and been president of the board at the homeless shelter in Salt Lake during a time of political strife when they were closing down the large old shelter and opening up new shelters around the city. And, and so I had experience dealing with kind of political challenges and things like that. So, um, again, though, I didn't, I didn't have specific experience as a Dean and I have had and continue to have my GM. I really cut out for this, but I think, again, I, I try to positively speak to myself about myself in my mind and believe that I can. And I think there are a lot of good things that are happening. And I, I hope the, that in the long run, this will be a good experience for me. And it'll be a good experience for all the people that I work with and that the school will move forward in positive ways. I believe that it will. I believe that it's happening. Uh, I think it's happening primarily because we have great faculty that work hard, great faculty, great staff that work really hard to create great opportunities for you. Yeah. Bob, in our class, we talk a lot about skill transferability. <clears throat> and earlier on in the semester, we looked at ourselves and the things we've done in our lives to pull out some commodifiable skills, skills that have value, whether it was something in high school, service projects, different experiences like that. And it, we, we spent some time translating that to, oh, you know what? I actually do have a lot of skills. I do have a lot of experience, even if it's not in a standard, you know, nine to five job. And I just, I love Bob's story so much because it, it just highlights that fact so, so well. All these volunteer opportunities where Bob was taking leadership in these roles, not only did he himself view how those skills transferred to becoming a dean, but the panel of people that he had to convince the value of the skills and experience he had in those opportunities allowed him to make a vertical leap, right? He, he skipped steps. He didn't have to become an associate dean. He was able to show that, hey, even if I might not have that traditional path, the skills and the experience that I have can bring the value you're looking for in this position. And so that's what we're talking about here, is, is when we're investing in ourselves, developing skills, we, we want, I don't know, maybe, maybe I should focus on this or that. But what's more important is understanding how you can translate that skill into value for future opportunities and then being able to communicate that. And that can really help with imposter syndrome. So that positive self-talk can be directed in a almost strategic way, to, so to speak, a, a, uh, yeah, I can, I can do this even though it's in a different context. You know, another, another thought process that I went through was just the whole process of getting the job was like, I, w I had been a professor at the University of Utah for 31 and a half years when I interviewed for this job. Another way of saying that is I had not interviewed for a job in over three decades. That's longer than anybody in this room. <laughs> okay. I had never, I hadn't interviewed for a job in 31 years. I was like, I have n I don't, I don't know how to get a Dean's job. Right. Was when I don't know how to do that. And, and I, but I sought out mentors. I sought out help to kind of figure out like, so how do you get a job like this? I don't even know. And talked to people and figured some things out and, you know, <laughs> I prettied up my, my Vita, my resume. That's like, it was the ugliest thing. <laughs> Cause why would it, why would it not be ugly? I'd never really needed anybody to see it in 31 years other than like for, you know, promotion and tenure and they don't care if it's pretty or not. And so, yeah, well, I feel like I've spoken long enough. And then I need to let you get on with your next set of speakers or whatever. But it's been a pleasure to be back in the classroom for a minute. It's funny, like I've, I did this for 35 years, four years before I started at University of Utah. And coming in here today, like you might think that I'm completely at ease. I'm not like I'm walking in today and I've only been away from it for a year.
but like I've been away from it for a year and I'm walking in front of a classroom with a bunch of students in it again who I don't know. And that's, there's still like, even though I did that for 35 years, there's still something a little uncomfortable about it. More so, like at the, I would find that every semester at the first day of class, even though I've done this and I know that I'm good at it because I've been told I'm good at it by a lot of people, um, there's still this little nervousness that comes because like, I don't know any of you. I, I know, I know one or a couple of you. <laughs> and, but like when you walk into a room of people that you don't know, that's just an inherently uncomfortable experience. Anyhow, well, back to you, Rita. Thanks, good to be with you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We don't want Okay, it's funny that he would say that before I introduce the next round of speakers because I walked in today and I said, Charles, I'm nervous today because I only know half the students in this classroom. So I feel it. Okay, so um, I wanted you to hear from you know somebody. Um, I wanted you to hear from Dr. Allen because I think it's important that you understand that it doesn't matter what role that you're applying for, you're going to feel this. But Heather, um, for you guys who don't know her, who's in marketing? Most of us, right? Okay, she, she manages us all, okay? So I feel bad for her because I feel like she adult babysits me, okay? Like she's helping me with anything that I need help with. So I don't know what I would, uh, I would, where I would be without her. Well, she is my little, my sounding block. So whenever I'm feeling something or I've had a great class, I actually stop and talk to Heather and tell her, hey, I've had this great class or hey, I have this concern, can you help me? And Heather shared a story with me, and she didn't realize that by sharing the story with me, I was going to say, Heather, can you please come talk to my class? <laughs> um, so Heather is going to talk specifically uh, about making that jump when you leave college into your first role and what that feels like, because it can be an uncomfortable situation. Okay? Um, and so I asked Heather to come and speak with us. So with that, Heather, I will let you introduce yourself. Okay. Thanks. I am a lot more comfortable being in the background, so uh, if I stumble a little bit or shake a little bit, that's why. So um, yeah, I'm Heather. I am the admin for the marketing department. I have been for about two years now. And my first experience, I'll just get right into that, was uh, right as I was graduating from college many years ago. I had several years of experience as a student secretary, and I felt very comfortable in that, and I thought, this is where most of my skill set is. I'm gonna look for a job that, a lot of interviewing, because at that point, there, were, there was a lot of for anything that I could think of. I was graduating out of BYU, and I was already in the area, so I was trying to stay on campus, because again, it was familiar. I knew a lot of the processes, so I was trying to stay there. And, uh, there were a lot of, um, most of the ones that I applied for were department secretary. So essentially what I'm doing right now. And I, looking at the job descriptions was interesting because I looked at them and I thought, not that big of a step, I can do this. That's totally fine. And when I did finally get the job that I did, for the first five or six months, I was in my office just absolutely sure someone was going to come knock on my door and say, we made a mistake, sorry, <laughs> because it was a much, much bigger leap than I realized. Uh, and sometimes that experience, you don't really get it until you're actually thrown in. But the volume increase from student secretary to department secretary in terms of responsibility and expectations was far bigger than I realized. And so like I said, those, those first five or six months were terrifying. I felt horribly incompetent. I felt like I wildly overestimated my skill set and what I could learn and how quickly I could learn it. And I felt like I was disappointing everybody because there was things I was forgetting. There was things I was missing. And um, it, took, it took several months and some very wonderful people that I was working with <laughs> who were very patient. Uh, and understanding to, for that to feeling to kind of at least fade. And over time, it got a lot better. Um, over time, I got more comfortable in the job and there's a steep learning curve going from any sort of part-time student position to an actual full-time career job. Uh, but it's something that you can certainly learn 
Um, like for example, right now, I have a training manual that I've created for myself to help me, especially with those things that I only do once or twice a year so I don't remember. And I write it down so that I have a, ref a reference to go back to. That is probably around 50 pages at least at this point. So there's, there's a lot of different things that I was expected to be able to just pick up and start being able to do competently. But it took, it definitely took time to get there. So. I want to know what questions you guys have. We didn't get Bob for questions, but we've got Heather. What questions do you have about <laughs> how this feels or how to overcome it? Yeah, I guess the question I would ask is, when you're feeling that overwhelm, when you're feeling they're going to fire me tomorrow, how did you talk yourself through that? How did you endure that? What was, what was the mental things you were saying? Um, that was a hard one because every day that I came in, I was a little bit surprised when they greeted me instead of saying, sorry, we made a mistake. Um, a lot of it was just looking at the task ahead of me and trying to say, okay, they hired me. I've done hard things before. Um, I didn't know what I was doing when I first started as a student. Um, I didn't know what I was doing when I went to a completely different country where I didn't know the language. I've done hard things. So I can just focus on this task at hand and not try to pay attention to everything down the road. I can do this and I can do it well. And just kind of doing that over and over and absolutely turning to the people around for questions, for resources, for help. And not try, and recognizing that there are people that will help. Yeah? Do you, think, do you think that not feeling qualified made you want to work even harder and like push yourself to learn and grow more? Absolutely. I didn't want to lose my job. <laughs> um, like I said, it's, it's funny how much I underestimated the leap. And so it really caught me by surprise. But looking around and recognizing there are other people doing this. This is not an impossible job. It's just something you have to learn how to do. So you learn how to do it. Can you just say that word for word one more time? I could like <laughs> put that on a poster somewhere. That's so good. Uh. I know, I know, I can remember word for word what you said. But it, it, it's not, when you feel overwhelmed, it's not impossible. Somebody else is doing it, you just have to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. you, you put it more eloquently than I did, but that, that concept, guys, listen, nobody knows what they're doing. When they get hired, trust me, like, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know exactly the technical skills or... There's no way you're going to be fully 100% prepared for a job or 100% qualified for a job. That's part of the game. That's part of the system. And so having confidence in that reality that it isn't who are you to say to get this job, why not you? There are other people doing this successfully. You just have to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's such a great example. I love that. And having the baseline of skills to build on. Like I wasn't trying to go into something where I, I really had zero experience. I was trying to build on the skills that I already had. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we talk about, a lot about the importance of networking, networking in this class. Are there any times in your career specifically where networking has helped you or you had to develop a network to help you? Um, yes, actually getting this job. <laughs> uh, I first started at UVU um, in a part-time role back in 2018. And uh, it was for the brand new engineering department. And that was, that was a baptism of, by fire. That one was a really hard, hard position with a brand new created from scratch department. Uh, and I didn't know anyone. So I came in on that one completely blind, just relying on experience. However, working in that area, uh, I was able to pick up how UVU does things, the processes, and learn from that. And I became friends with Susan Dunn, who was the financial manager of uh, CET at that time. And when she moved over here and I started looking around and saying, okay, I think I need to get a full-time job. Money is always fun. Um, she was my main point of contact. She was the one who recommended that I apply for this job. So that's, that's how I ended up in Woodbury. So networking makes a big difference. It shouldn't necessarily mean that you get something you're not qualified for, but it may 
open opportunities and be a good reference that helps. Again, just to highlight that, the four people that have spoken in this room all have their jobs here because of people we know. I got hired because of people I know. Heather did, Rita, Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen's friends were the ones telling him to go apply to the job. You know what I'm saying? And that's not just a UVU specific thing. That is truly a universal experience. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? For Heather, before we move on to our next little bit. You're not you. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so sure. Okay, please. Okay, so now we're going to talk a lot about what's already been talked about today. And we're going to talk about this. 75% of professionals have felt a lack of confidence or imposter syndrome when applying for a new position. Charles and I decided the other 25% probably aren't applying for a new position. Okay? Um, but uh, he's not wrong. Um, so Dr. Allen was actually my network into UVU. Um, so not only is networking important when you're finding that next job, but it can also help you when you want a job right away. Okay, um, so uh, Charles and I actually started at the same time. We have both felt this imposter syndrome. Okay, we've both felt like, hey, somebody's gonna knock on our door and be like, oh, hey, <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not qualified for this. Um, but, um, so, I, so that's why we decided to have this conversation today is, is making sure that we're uh, addressing it. But networking, I um, reached out to Dr. Allen at the second week of April. Usually teaching positions are filled in May and June. Okay, you're usually contracted and you start in July or August. Um, I, for any of those who took my um, 1890 and 3890 classes last semester, I actually got the material because I got hired the day before the semester started and I didn't get any materials until the week after classes started. Okay, so I had made, my husband, um, we found out he had a, a life-changing illness on August 13th of last year. I was hired here before the 20th of August. So having that network of people to introduce you to people, it does, it does make a difference. So when we talk about imposter syndrome, there are actually five different types of imposter syndrome, okay? Um, so this is the perfectionist, okay? You know who you are. This is the anxiety um, if things are not done perfectly, okay? Uh, the expert. Um, Heather might have fallen into this. Uh, the fact that she's made a 50-page handbook is crazy to me, but that's, that's cool. Um, and these are the people who have the fear of the, that they might lack the knowledge. Uh, the soloist, these are those people who don't want to ask for help for anything. We just want to do it ourselves, okay? Um, Dr. Allen alluded to this, the natural genius, okay? Stresses over not uh, succeeding on the first try or not being the smartest person in the room. Um, and... Women, I'm talking to you on this one because I know we feel this. The superhuman feels guilty if we don't please everybody, okay? So these are definitely five types of imposter syndrome that, that you can experience. Uh, real quick, what yeah. if you identify as all five? I identify as all five. We're good. People, yeah. Yep, you, you can have a little bit of all of this. <laughs> Charles, you feeling that way? Oh, 100%. No, when I, got, when I got first hired as an adjunct even, um, I, I definitely felt imposter syndrome to the max. I wanted I wanted every student to be 100% happy. Felt like I had to know everything. I felt like lesson number one had to be perfect. I had to, yeah, soloist. I couldn't rely on other professors. I mean, I had to be independent. And then perfectionist, yeah, I mean, everything had to be perfect. And so, yes. <laughs> Anybody else in our boat can feel? Yeah, see some head shaking, yep. Okay, so there are ways to overcome this, okay? Um, and you've heard a lot of the ways of overcoming this already. Focus on the facts, okay? So the, what are the facts? What are your skills? We've already talked about your skills. Everybody in this room should have a list of your skill sets, okay? Um, know what your skills are. Um, learn from, other to, from team members or learn from other people. You've heard that today. We're, we uh, don't think that you have to find out all the information on your own. Learn from other people. Um, fight feelings with evidence. We're going to talk more about this in a minute, but you're going to go back to that list of skills, okay, when you're feeling um, uncomfortable. Here's a big one, and the reason that we're talking about this today is acknowledging and releasing feelings, is the fact that we want to give this a name. When you are feeling this way, it has a name, okay? Um, it is called imposter syndrome. Uh, reframe negative thoughts. So here's a big one. How do you talk to yourself, okay? What does that inner dialogue say? If you would not talk to your mom, 
to your close friends that way, um, then you need to change your self-thought. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Anticipate when these feelings are going to sneak in. Okay. Um, when Charles and I talked about uh, joining classes today, I was like, oh, yeah, what are you going to do in this class? Do you want to take this on? And do you want to present, right? Uh, because, hey, I still feel, have feelings of inadequ inadequacy on this one. I wanted her to talk because I feel like y'all are sick of hearing me. <laughs> so there you go. That's, there you go. We're good. And my, my class probably feels the same way. So um, share it with someone. Okay. So share it with a friend. Um, share, share the how you feel with somebody because you are not alone. So many times um, this can be such an isolating feeling. Imposter syndrome can make you can make it, it. It makes you feel like there's nobody else experiencing this. It's just me. And that's not the case. As soon as it has a name and you talk to somebody about it, they'll tell you, oh my gosh, I experienced that too. Okay. Um, for those, for those people wanting to go into a certain industry and you may not have all of the skill set, but you meet at least 50%, get a mentor there. That's how we're going to find, uh, that's how we're going to get into those industries. And you are going to start tooting your own horn because every single person in here is awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I think about the little Lego guy when I'm saying that, but right. Everybody is, you are all so good at something in here. You all excel at something. And I want you to start tooting your own horn, but we're all going to be looking for jobs here soon. So what do I want you to do when it comes to beating, uh, beating out the imposter syndrome, building your confidence, whatever it is that you want to call it. Okay. It's either one of those is identify your strengths and accomplishments. So you should already have a list, but I want you to keep that list handy. What are those things that you're really good at? A good place that if, if you are having a lot of negative self-talk, is to write them on your bathroom mirror with a dry erase marker, okay? Write some of those things that you're good at on your mirror. It comes off, okay? Trust me, it does. So um, maybe you put two or three things for the week. Next week, you put something else. You spend a lot of time in front of that bathroom mirror, believe it or not, and it's a good place, it's a good time to uh, remind yourself of your, your skill sets. Okay. Re also, this is literally your assignment. This is your final project for this class is to identify your swings and accomplishments in the capstone portfolio template. So you have to do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be great. Hey, it's a place for you to go back and constantly look at it. So reframe that negative self talk. Pay attention to what you're saying to yourself. Okay. So today I want you to pay attention to what are you, what are you saying? Okay. What evidence do I have to support this negative self thought? You likely don't have any. Okay. So start talking about you. Start talking to yourself as you would your mom, your close friends. Okay, start talking to yourself that way. Um, seek support from mentors and peers. Every single person who got up here today talked about having that support from friends, from mentors. Okay, from from their peers. So make sure that you are seeking that support. And then practice self compassion. Okay, be kind to yourself, um, and make sure that you're. you're I love this. Um, make sure that you treat yourself with the same compassion you would a friend. Okay. Um, so if you're having this negative self thought, it is okay to talk to your close friends and family, right? So Charles told me a story about, um, his wife sharing this with him. Okay. His wife was sharing how she was talking to herself. And he said, I wouldn't let anybody talk to my wife that way, including you. And his wife quickly had a, 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 tr a change, right? She, she, she changed her thought process. I said, nobody talks to my wife that way, not even you. <laughs> and uh, it, it like shook her up, yeah. Yeah. Because that, that, that exactly this point, I mean, that, 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 those stories you tell yourself, whether they're implanted by uh, garbage parenting or some leader or person in your community who told you a story about you, and that just starts getting replayed in your brain until you start regurgitating it to yourself and saying it out loud, or in your own inner dialogue, just recognize that, first off, no one should ever talk to anybody that way. No one deserves it. And you haven't earned that. Like you are so much more, you are so much more deserving of kindness. And the expectations that have been placed upon you, uh, all those things that we talked about, the perfectionism, needing to know everything, needing to please everybody, it's bullshit. It's, it's straight up nonsense, magical thinking. It's, it's actually in psychology, it's called a thinking error. But what is real is the feelings that we experience when we have the inner dialogue. And so this is the balance that we're going to try this. We're going to navigate a very complicated mental health thing in a two minute conversation. But the nuance here is when you hear that self talk, 
to validate the emotion, to say, when I, when I hear that voice in my head, it makes me feel discouraged. Allow that, accept that feeling. Say, yeah, I feel discouraged right now. And, semicolon, we aren't going to resist it. What we resist persists. So instead, we're going to say, yeah, I've been told that. I have felt, I've even told myself that. And, I'm going to look at the evidence. And I'm going to practice compassion. And I'm going to rely on my friends and family when it's hard. And that's how we overcome the imposter syndrome. And that's how we practice self-compassion. And that's how we get super successful in life. The biggest person in our way to success is ourselves. And so this is how we navigate that in a very delicate and tricky and nuanced way. But we do it. And when we can, life gets unlocked. It's great. And you find those jobs you absolutely love. Because as much as you guys scare me standing up in front of you, I love doing this. Okay, so I want to I want to end with two things. Again, it is it can be a mental health thing. So I do want to tell you that if you can't overcome this, it is okay to go talk to somebody. There are people out there available um, to talk to you about it. Okay, um, I had a professor in my MBA program tell me, "Hey, I'm not I can't be your mentor until you go talk to somebody about this," and I did. Okay, uh, number two, um, if you uh, if that's not your jam, there is a great book out there called "The Empress Wears No Clothes." Okay. And I will make sure that you guys all have the link for that. And that is a great book um, about this imposter syndrome and the steps to overcome it. Okay, so here's what I task you guys with this week. I task you guys with have, making sure that you have this um, list of your strengths and accomplishments as you're looking for positions, okay? Um, and then I want you to think about how you talk to yourself this week. And if you are having that negative self-thought, I want you to try to make it positive, okay? What evidence do I have? make it more positive. So that's what I task you with this week, you guys. Have a great week. Thank you, Rita. Thanks so much. <laughs>